You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis, your host for BioTalk. And we have a special edition of BioTalk today. And there's this reason that we're doing a special edition because we have some exciting new technology that's going to be introduced to the BioHealth Capital Region and those that can actually see it in person on Friday in Baltimore. And we're talking about new technology from Galen Robotics, who was one of our prior winners of our Crab Trap competition at one of our BioHealth Capital Region forums in the past. So they are making significant progress. And we have the privilege of talking to Dave Saunders, who's the chief technology officer and co-founder of Galen Robotics, and going to give us an update on how the company has progressed over the last several years and where they are today. And he has some exciting news we're going to talk about for our listeners. And generally, we don't do a video on an audio podcast, but we're going to also have some links to some interesting technology for the listeners to see which I think is going to be pretty exciting for all. So let's get started. And Dave Saunders, Chief Technology Officer, Galen Robotics, welcome to BioTalk. Hi, Rich. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, it's great to get an update from you. I think we did this as a follow-up to our past Crab Trap winners where we did little short vignettes, but now we have a little more time to get a little more in-depth with you today. So before we start and talking about your new technology and Galen, Let's talk a little bit about you and what led you to becoming a co-founder of an interesting robotic company and also locating it in Baltimore, Maryland. Sure. I've bounced around the U.S. a bit in my earlier years. I actually was in uh, Topeka, Kansas for a while, and I went to school there, and I left early to move actually out here to the D.C., Virginia area, the DMV, and worked for a early internet startup company well before there were dot coms or anything like that. And I moved from there to uh, Send Communications and I was at Lucent Technologies where one of my teams that I managed actually built the original Apple Airport. If you remember that little flying saucer looking thing, we actually knocked that out. There's actually Lucent technology inside. And that's always been a fun thing for me. I just, I really enjoy building new products especially because of the internet. I've always loved just connecting people. You know, I used to say in different talks I would do that if the internet was just about connecting computers, I'm not really all that interested. I'm more interested in the impact that it has on people. And about 10 years ago, I moved to California where I was working on some other companies with the Galen Robotics co-founder, Bruce LeCorwick. And in 2016, we had just put another company to bed, and we were approached by the director of technology management at Johns Hopkins Technology Ventures. We were approached by those guys, and they said, hey, we've got some new technology that's been developed by uh, Russell Taylor, who's the uh, father of surgical robotics, and he's the professor and director of the uh, laboratory for computing and sensory robotics here at Johns Hopkins. They said, would you guys be interested in taking a look at it and maybe commercializing it. And I knew who Russell Taylor was, so it didn't take much convincing to get me to come out here and kick the tires for a while. And we did a great license with Johns Hopkins, and we immediately began hiring master's students and a couple of PhD candidates. And so we began working very, very tightly with Johns Hopkins and began to build that company. And that's actually when that whole crab trap thing happened. And that was a lot of fun. And That was actually our very first prototype of the robot, which has changed quite a bit to these days, but it just, we had a lot of great experiences. Bruce and I would come out here to Baltimore about one week out of every month. We were actually here in Baltimore. And shortly before the whole COVID lockdown, we had actually come to an agreement with the state of Maryland and they gave us a whole incentive package to move the company headquarters out here and make this our new home. So we've opened our offices in one of the opportunity zones over here in West Baltimore, right behind Ravens Stadium. We continue to work very closely with Johns Hopkins, and we're at about 40 employees now. So we've come a long way from two guys and a couple of dogs 
And we're actually only a few months shy of submitting to the FDA for our initial approval for this technology. So cross your fingers. It's frowned upon by the FDA to comment on how hopeful you are about your uh, FDA clearance, but we are hopeful. We've done a lot of work and it's pretty exciting to be here. I think this technology has a lot of potential to uh, fill a lot of unmet needs in this industry. Well, you know what's interesting, Dave, is that generally companies from Maryland, if they have an opportunity, they'll sometimes go to Silicon Valley (laughs) or San Jose or Boston. And what we have is the reverse here, which is really refreshing for people and our listeners to see a Silicon Valley company moving into our region and into Baltimore, which is really a great success story. So what do you think the deciding factor was for you guys to make that decision and the big leap to come from the Valley to the DMV or the biohealth capital region? I certainly love California. It was a fun place to be, but it is a big state and there's a huge amount of competition. There's a lot of flash. There's a lot of glitz. And sometimes who gets funded is really just who has the prettiest PowerPoint deck. And that's my personal opinion, but I've had a lot of experience with fundraising and startups and California just kind of has that flair. And out here in Baltimore, especially because of our close association with Johns Hopkins, people were really interested in looking at what it was we were doing, as well as what the technology would be applied for. And so to say it's easier, it's easier to work out here, especially for something like biotech, because there's such a legacy, there's such an infrastructure. Not only do you have multiple fantastic hospitals right here in Baltimore, but you have multiple universities churning out extremely qualified, talented individuals. So the hiring pool is fantastic. And you've got a lot of folks that live here that honestly, they want to stay here. When it comes to hiring, especially uh, recently graduated folks, we haven't had a lot of difficulty convincing folks that like, hey, you're not going to move to California. You're actually going to stay right here in Baltimore. And they're like, really? That's great. <laughs> so it's been a great opportunity. And again, the fact that I get to work with somebody like Russell Taylor and some of the surgeons at the hospital, it's a fantastic opportunity. And we do work with Stanford as well, but you're competing for a, a lot of attention in an environment like that. And yet here, Keep in mind that a lot of the department heads at Stanford did their residency at Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins gives birth to so many people and professionals around the world. Rainbows should be shooting out of Baltimore every time I talk about it because it really is that kind of place. So I'm happy to be here. I really am. This is exciting because also when the state of Maryland or local economic development officials make a bet on an early stage company, you never know whether it's going to result in 40 employees in a company, there's always that promise that it's going to happen. But here's a success story where it's actually happened. And the incentives that were given potentially up front were well worth it for the state and the region, as well as everybody involved. So congratulations for what you've done so far. Thanks. And I uh, hope that we blow past 40 in the near future. Revenue is just over the hill. And my favorite version of venture capital is revenue. So I'll be really excited when we're selling product. (laughs) Okay. Well, we'll get into the revenues per employee later after you get into that stage. But for the time being, though, a lot of people would say, who needs another surgical robot? They've been around for quite a while. There's large companies. You have global companies that are involved in this area. So it wasn't probably the easiest technological area to enter into. So Talk a little bit about the evolution of what Russell Taylor did and what you saw that was unique about this technology to form Galen Robotics around it. It's really amazing. I think a lot of people don't actually realize how many surgical robots exist in the marketplace. In the spine industry alone, there are seven different companies that are out there with spine robots that do nothing but fusion surgery for the spine. When you look at the timeline and you go all the way back to the beginning, Russell Taylor, he was responsible for the first commercial surgical robot, which was from a company called Robodoc. They're now called Think Surgical. And that's a robot that does knee and hip implants. And then around the same time, a few years later than that, Intuitive Surgical was founded and they actually bought a ton of Russell Taylor's patents from his days at IBM. And that actually became the Da Vinci. 
But also keep in mind, you've got LASIK robots, you've got Zimmer owns something called the Rosa, which does knees and hips and biopsy needles for the brain. And there's robots in a lot of different areas. But at the same time, there are tons of surgical disciplines that have no robotic or really any kind of high tech support for them which also includes a lot of like even neurosurgical procedures. You think that would be like the gold mine for surgical robots, and yet there's not a lot of technology there. And because Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Hospital are just so tightly intertwined, Russell Taylor had just a constant influx of surgeons coming over to him, especially ear, nose, and throat, as well as neurosurgeons saying, where are our tools? Why don't we have technology that can help support our procedures. And when you think about operating on your vocal cord or if you're operating on your middle ear, these are procedures that are ergonomically tight in ways that are shocking to even realize. When you're trying to operate on a person's middle ear, you're drilling through the hardest bone in the human body, the mastoid, which is right behind your ear, to get access to some of the smallest parts of the anatomy in the human body And as I often say, there are no mulligans in these surgeries. If you make a mistake, you can have a patient that went under anesthesia, not being able to hear well, and they wake up stone deaf. And these are irreparable injuries. And the hand-eye coordination and just even the challenges in stabilizing the instrument and making sure it's not flicking even like a half a millimeter to the wrong direction is very, very challenging. What there's results in is the number of surgeons qualified to do these kinds of procedures is much, much smaller than it needs to be. And so you have a lot of these surgeons that have like six-month waiting lists to do procedures because it's so hard to replicate what they do. And if you think about it, even the most gifted of hands have a shelf life. And I'm not talking about like big handshakes. Just under a microscope, you start to see a little bit of age-related hand tremor And now you've got some challenges. And yet these people, they have got all this knowledge and all this memory. So that was one of the big challenges that needed to be addressed. And the other issue was, if you take the reimbursements and how you pay for some of these surgeries for laryngeal and a lot of upper head and neck procedures, you can't afford a $2 million robot. So you need technology that can actually fit the economics of the surgery. And so when you look at the robots that are on the market today, these are all robots with million dollar plus price tags and their engineering locks them into specific procedures. A spine robot is not going to do LASIK. It's not going to do a prostectomy. There isn't a lot of mobility between these technologies. And that's one of the reasons why there are so many robots. So the opportunity that we had was to create a robot that was much, much smaller very portable that you could wheel from one OR to the next. That's a big challenge today. Some of these robots are so big that once they go into an OR, sometimes they have to be assembled in pieces in the OR, and then they never leave that particular OR. So the surgeons, they wanted something that could just be wheeled around like a piece of equipment, and they wanted something that was economical in the sense that it could actually fit into the current reimbursement structure for some of these lower paying procedures. And that's an important thing, you know, not to be too cynical, but if you can't pay for the technology, there's no market for it. And so that was a really important consideration. So Russell Taylor and some of his postdocs developed what we are now bringing to market, which was a very lightweight robot that followed your hand. So instead of being used remote control like a Da Vinci, or instead of being used completely autonomously like the LASIK robot, you just kind of line it up over your eye and you hit a button and it just does its thing by itself. What we wanted to do was have a robot that would actually take the instruments that you're already going to use anyway, hold it with you. So the surgeon still holds the instrument that they would normally be holding, but the robot is holding it at the same time. And it feels the surgeon's hand motions. And so the instrument is just moving completely transparently, just like power steering in a car. You turn the wheel and there's a mechanical linkage and an enhancement system that's actually turning your tires, but you feel like you're in control because you're turning the wheel. Same kind of thing here. The robot is moving the instrument, but you are still in complete control. You are where you would normally do the procedure. You are doing it without any modifications. You're not modifying your procedure to accommodate the robot or anything like that. 
And that was a huge, huge opportunity. What resulted from this is that we now have what we are looking at is a potential platform technology that has the potential to support a wide variety of surgical procedures. And all we have to do is hold the appropriate instruments for that procedure. So we have a vision that this technology will eventually be applied not only for ear, nose, and throat, but for neurosurgery, cardiovascular, intrauterine, limb reattachments, tissue reconstruction. There are a lot of procedures that none of the existing surgical robots in the market today even touch, partly because of engineering, partly because of cost profile issues. And so we're not pretending to be a Da Vinci. We're not pretending to be a RoboDoc. Those robots, they fill their niches. We're actually going into a lot of areas where other robots, they're not even going. They're not even looking at those areas. It's a great opportunity. And the technology is really amazing to watch. It's pretty exciting. It sounds like you're trying to fill a gap that exists within this industry, which I wouldn't say is totally mature, but it's been around for quite a while. And people have to really find ways to differentiate themselves from those people who are out there. You mentioned all of the big names and all of the big bucks that are behind this. So at the end of the day, how can a nimble small company in Baltimore basically come up with something that will have much more usability at a more cost-effective price than all of these large companies out there that have unlimited resources? Their guns are focused on the procedures that they're going after. If you're somebody like, and I love the intuitive surgical technology, but it's a big expensive robot and it has about 8% of the total laparoscopic market, they have so much growth in the market that they're already optimized for, they just don't even need to come down into these other areas of the body. And that's true for a lot of these other surgical robots. There are some of these robots that are designed for hips, knees, spine fusion, things like that. Their functionality is baked into their DNA. So to actually turn a spine robot into like an ear, nose, and throat robot almost requires you to just throw out the technology and start from scratch. So as you said, even though surgical robots have been around for a little over 20 years, they've barely scratched the surface of really penetrating the surgical market. I mean, they're 10, 15%, maybe total coverage of all surgical procedures. So there's so much growth for the robots where they already are that even though we talk to all of the big guys, I have regular meetings with, you name the Fortune 50 med tech company and we have regular meetings with them. They know about this technology and they wish us well because they've got their own fish to fry. So there's a lot of room in this market. There's a lot of room. What's tough for our listeners right now is we're talking about some very interesting technology that would be beautiful to see. <laughs> and it's hard to visualize without actually seeing it. But what we're going to do for the listeners is we're going to develop a link to a video which Galen has developed and you'll be able to actually see the robot in action. And if anybody, and we're going to talk about this later as well, if anybody really wants to see this in person, there's going to be a live demo of this at your new headquarters and facility on Friday. What time is that going to be, Dave? Uh, it's going to be from 10 in the morning to uh, 2 in the afternoon. And the location is going to be? It's 1100 Wicomico Street, W-I-C-O-M-I-C-O. -I -C -O. We're about two blocks from the Raven Stadium. And there'll be signs and everything at the main entrance. And uh, if somebody would like to uh, join us, just shoot us an email first at openhouse at galenrobotics.com. And uh, we'll put you on the list. Super. Well, we're going to repeat that again when we close out this podcast. But this is one of those rare times when I wish that we were doing a video podcast rather than audio podcast because there's so much for the listeners to see. So it is fun to show off. I'll tell you, I <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. And based on your enthusiasm and describing it, people probably get pretty energized after they see you demoing it, Dave. So let's talk a little bit more about the company and the technology at this particular point in time. So this isn't an easy thing to bring to market. <laughs> so let's talk about what are the major milestones and challenges in front of you before you're actually going to have your first commercial sales? As I said, we're very hopeful that we're going to have clearance from the FDA in the pretty near future. 
the FDA doesn't like me to comment on timelines like that, but we're hoping it's just over the hump. And if this was a robot that required capital sales, then you've got an 18 month sales cycle. You got to go to, you got to get on budgets and all those sorts of things. So what we've done, because Bruce and I came out of the high tech internet industry, we've been doing things as a service platforms for years. And so we had this idea that like, gosh, if the cost of the robot for us to manufacture is low enough, and we can keep it low enough, then we should be able to afford to actually place the robot at hospitals, let them go through training, do some cadaver studies or whatever they want to do to get used to it. And then they pay per use in the OR for actual human use. And so get rid of the big CapEx expenditure. So we feel we have a go-to-market strategy that is very unique in this industry. Most surgical robots are still out there with big price tags that you got to pay up front to get the thing into. So we're hoping that by placing the robots, we're going to be able to get into the market much more quickly. As I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of potential for this technology moving into different surgical disciplines. And so once we get our initial clearance, it's going to be kind of a serial process of we identify more instruments. We're going to be doing cadaver labs with multiple universities, not just here in Baltimore, but we've got a bunch of different research groups that have been working with this technology and early prototypes. So we're going to be identifying different procedures where the surgeons really feel that this technology as it is can give them a lot of bang for their buck if we just support the right instruments, get those things cleared with the FDA and just serially move along. And so that's our first beachhead. In addition to that, we are working with Johns Hopkins as well as a couple other universities on smarter instruments. There are certain procedures, just to give you an example, there are certain procedures where you're using what looks like a glorified Dremel tool to cut away bone. And it's spinning about 80,000 RPMs. And sometimes the bones that you're drilling have like paper thin surfaces and below there's a pocket or some of the bones are so tiny that if you push on it too hard, you can actually break the bone instead of just shaving away a little portion of it. Now, if you're just holding that tool in your bare hand, there's not a lot the technology can do. But what if you had sensors that could detect how hard you're pressing the drill against the patient tissue? And because the robot is also holding the drill with you, we can now limit how much pressure you could apply. So we're looking at those kinds of technologies through our research partnerships with Johns Hopkins and other universities so that we can begin to equip the robot with smart instruments that have integrated sensors that can help provide the surgeon with just better capabilities than they have today with their own bare hands. And so we've got a lot of different areas that we're exploring there. And it's just, there's a lot of potential. Big milestone is just getting it installed in the hospital's getting it supported with instruments that they already are familiar with today, but then using those install bases as a technology leap to develop smarter instruments for tomorrow. One of the challenges for people in this industry that a regulated industry is that you have to get FDA approval, but then you also have to, as you say, get the reimbursement codes established, which is regulatory and pricing are two of the biggest obstacles that all of the companies have that are trying to get their products to market. Isn't it nice to have the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services located in Baltimore from a, a pricing standpoint, and then the FDA located 30 minutes away up in Montgomery County? Is there a benefit to having those kind of resources in your backyard? It is really useful. I mean, so far, we haven't had to have an in-person meeting with the FDA, our Q-subs, as they're called have actually been through correspondence. But there are times when the FDA will call you down and they'll say, we need to examine something or we need to come up and look at some files or whatever. And being able to have that kind of interaction, it forms a partnership because ultimately the CDC and the NIH, who's also right here in River City, so to speak, and the FDA, they want these kinds of technologies to come to market. And so they certainly want to make sure that we are doing it safely. And so we have a great responsibility to make sure that anything that we do is safe and efficacious. But we've got local partners here that are interested in helping us do exactly that. It's very, very convenient to be part of that ecosystem. It's very helpful. 
And, and basically, you can't do this without having funding. So talk a little bit about your funding strategy and funding successes to date. We closed the first half of our Series A in January, and we've got a little bit of a tranche that we're finishing up, and that'll be done there. Our initial money, we raised about $15 million in convertible notes from seed investors. So we survived COVID, man. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty rough. I know a lot of CEOs from pre-revenue med tech companies that did not do as well as we did. And so these were a rough couple of years and we just managed to pound right through. So the funding has been nice. Bruce and I, we're kind of minimalists. We don't believe in like the old dot-com days of you do like these $100 million raises and everybody gets mahogany desks and all of that kind of stuff. So that also makes it more challenging to raise money in California because you've got these nine, ten $10 billion funds and they literally can't write checks smaller than about $75 million because you can only sit on so many boards. So out here, the size of the funds is a little bit more sane from my perspective. And so it just gave us a great opportunity to come in and provide an investment opportunity for funds here in the mid-Atlantic that are the right fit for what we wanted to do. So this is actually for us and because of our goals, this environment was actually an easier fundraising environment for us than California was. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that basically you can go a lot further on less money here than you could in Boston or San Francisco based on some of the expectations, number one. Number two, if you look at the cost of facilities like your new facility you're going to be in, plus the cost for the new employees that you're hiring, while it's a competitive wage, it's not the same as what you'd have to encounter out in Silicon Valley. And they can afford apartments out here. Yeah, right. (laughs) We made offers for some new graduates in past years, and they had gotten these like huge comparative offers, but it required them to move right to Silicon Valley immediately. They got out there and we got email from them going, well, I thought I was getting this great salary, but it turns out I can't afford a place unless I have at least three roommates. (laughs) So we're like, oh, sorry. Yeah. And the office space expense here is probably 20% that of San Jose. It's a big cost savings in terms of infrastructure to come out here. And yet keep in mind, a lot of these companies like ours included, are using cloud technologies and all of these basic infrastructures that are just as available here as they are in Silicon Valley. A lot of people forget that Digex, which was one of the first commercial ISPs in the whole world, was right here in Baltimore. And the infrastructure for internet access is, I would say, better or if not at least equal to anywhere that I would go in Silicon Valley. I'd say that the Commerce Department for the state of Maryland and the Chamber of Commerce would love to have you as a spokesperson. (laughs) You're basically preaching all of the attributes of this great region. Yeah, the humidity is a little higher. (laughs) There's trade-offs for everything, of course. (laughs) Well, you're close to the water. You're a little close to the harbor there. (laughs) This has been really interesting, and uh, we could go on for a lot longer, but is there anything that you think the listeners would like to learn more about Galen Robotics than what we've discussed now that you'd like to volunteer? Yeah, I think we've pretty much covered it, but I hope folks are able to check out the uh, technology video and at the same time, you know, go and look at Johns Hopkins and the LCSR, and look at just some of the amazing research that is being done in the field of robotics right here in Baltimore. This is an amazing place in terms of developed technologies and just in terms of the legacy of people that are here in Baltimore that are supporting biotech as an industry. I mean, this is a a real gem. Yeah, so we've been talking with Dave Saunders, Chief Technology Officer, co-founder of Galen Robotics in Baltimore, Maryland, who has an exciting live demo at their new facility on this Friday. Dave, let's give everybody the details if they have an interest in attending that. Sure. Shoot us an email at openhouse at galenrobotics.com, and the address will be 1100 Wacomico Street, W-I-C-O-M-I-C-O. That's uh, right behind Raven Stadium, right here in Baltimore. Thank you much, Dave. And we wish you the best of luck. And we know the mayor is going to be there on Friday and a lot of other officials. So good luck on your open house. And we hope that you have to double the space within the next year. Me too. Thanks a lot, Rich. 
Thanks for listening to Biotalk with Rich Bendis. 